like to acknowledge, I think probably repeating what our dean has already said, that we are meeting together today on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of Skogalg Island First Nation. Um, in order, and that is particularly relevant, that necessary uh, acknowledgement, because we're working together today to talk to you about uh, a customary international legal right of Indigenous peoples, which we've recently identified and which pertains to at least the peoples of the Americas. So we began this work, as uh, Tom has indicated, as we were colleagues on a project for the United Nations. We had been asked to develop um, recommendations to build resilience against atrocity crimes in Latin America. There was a long history of atrocity <coughs> crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, genocide, involving indigenous peoples in Latin America. And so as we began to uh, look for triggers, we realized that conflicts around access to resources, and particularly land, had been a traditional trigger of uh, atrocity crimes. And we began to look more closely into uh, ways of trying to enhance uh, respect for the right of free, prior, and informed consent, which we had identified as a, a emerging right of customary international law. But as we did this, Nelsie began to do very detailed uh, research into the cases. Whoops, sorry, I'm not sure what I'm showing you because I'm looking at uh, an identical piece here. So we began to uh, realize that there was a connection between land rights, the right of, rights of consent, variously interpreted, and a distinctive emerging right, which Nelsie will be, begin to tell you about. So if you want to visually imagine the relationship between the rights we are working on, it would be good to think of a triangle. And if you have this triangle in mind, put at the apex of the triangle the right to physical and cultural survival. And at the bottom of the triangle, very related to and sustaining the one that is above, land tenure, uh, property rights of indigenous people, and ethnic as a generic right that involves ways or different degrees of participation of indigenous people. So if it is a triangle and we take off one of the sides, what will happen is that the right that is at the apex of this triangle will be weaker. But what would happen if we take both of these rights? There would be certainly a violation a full violation of their right to physical and cultural survival. So with this triangular relationship in mind, I want you to get into um, exploration of a working definition of the right to physical and cultural survival. And since this is a right that we are not making up, but just doing research on, I want to, to take into account and to acknowledge people who have previously defined the right and in particular, I want to start by acknowledging uh, indigenous definition of the right to physical and cultural survival. This definition is a 1985 definition given by Jose Uranavi. He is the former president of Confederación de Indígenas del Oriente Boliviano. And he said, speaking to the UN, our principal struggle is for the land, our territory and natural resources. Our defense of the land and natural resources is for the cultural survival of our children. For us, the first thing is to secure our land, which belongs to us by right, because we are the owners of the land and natural resources. We indigenous peoples know that without land, there cannot be education, there cannot be health, there can be no life. And this indigenous root is very important to keep in mind because somehow it will resonate also at the international scenario. For instance, in 2008, the Inter-American Court on Human Rights in the, in the interpretation of the Saramaka v. Surinam judgment said, Sur survival must be understood as the ability of indigenous people to preserve protect, and guarantee the special relationship that they have with their territory so that 
they may continue living their traditional way of life. And in 2010, in one of the national high courts in, South, in Central America, the Belize Supreme Court said in a case related to Maya people, the instant case is about land. From the evidence, the Maya people have found sustenance and continuity in the lands they presently occupy, which were once occupied by the four bears. Therefore, for them, the dispute is more than just about land, although so much depends on this. It is really about their way of life and their very survival. And finally, sorry, I, I am one slide advanced. In 2015, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights clarified in their report on indigenous people and Afro-descendant communities and natural resources that this right is a dynamic one. So when we're talking about the right to physical and cultural survival, we're not talking about one static way of life or one static culture. According to the Inter-American Commission, survival should be understood in a coherent manner with the indigenous self-rights, with the aim of not giving rise to a static conception of their ways of life. When determining its scope, their right to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development must be considered. If we want to do a working definition of the right to physical and cultural survival that takes into account the common elements among the definitions that I have just read, we can just extract three agents that are related, or three elements that are related to each other. We are talking about a relational right. We have indigenous people, indigenous land, and indigenous people's culture or way of life within a dynamic understanding or, of the latest. So if we have indigenous people and indigenous land, we should take into account that they need to secure their relationship with their land. And the land needs to be protected by indigenous people. If we have indigenous land and indigenous people, we should take into account that the indigenous land is the essential site of development for indigenous people, and that the meaning to the land is given by this indigenous people's way of life. And if we find the relationship between indigenous peoples, culture, and indigenous people themselves, we will find that indigenous people's culture or way of life constitute an indigenous people. And without indigenous people, there is no possible incarnation of this culture or way of life. So I think Nancy has given you a clear sense of what the right of physical and cultural survival consists in, in specific domestic jurisdictions across Latin America and in the jurisprudence and judicial reasoning of the Inter-American Court and the Inter-American Commission. So how is this, how is this more than a very interesting uh, particular phenomenon in different states in Latin America? It is more because the this, the practice and the, the psychological element, as it's called, involved in the recognition of the right of physical and cultural survival, both meet the criteria for customary international law. Now, many of you may not be familiar with the rules of customary international uh, legal identification, but the sources of international law are conventionally understood to have been enumerated exhaustively in an article that outlines where judges of the International Court of Justice should look for law in deciding cases that come before them. So this actually dates back to 1920, to the precursor for the International Court of Justice. But the, the text remains the same. International custom is evidence of a general practice accepted as law. That's the, the sort of standard definition of customary international law. And what we would like to help you to understand is that this right of physical and cultural survival actually meets the criteria not of general customary international law, law but of what's called particular customary international law that's restricted to a particular region. 
And the jurisprudence of the ICJ has established over many decades that Latin America, the Latin American legal environment is particularly conducive to the production of regional norms of customary international law. So I've just included here uh, the, the phrasing that's been employed by the Special Rapporteur on the Identification of Customary International Law. It's a long phrase. It's the name of, the, it's the job title of uh, a legal expert appointed by the International Law Commission to look into uh, international, sorry, customary international law identification and creation. I'd like you, the thing that I want you to see here is that a general practice accepted as law is the current definition that is before, is about to be before the General Assembly of the United Nations. That's the definition of customary international law. It doesn't say anything about states. Mm -hmm. Now, what we would like you to see, and I'm going to try to be um, quite rapid here, what we would like you to understand is that we believe that there is substantial evidence, as you'll see here, in domestic jurisprudence, as well as in the findings, which I have no time to discuss with you, of uh, the inter-American system. Substantial evidence that the right of physical and cultural survival is understood as obligatory, as well as, as recognized and practiced, particularly in the jurisprudence of these states and, and this court system. And one of the slides that I didn't take the time to discuss with you talked about the way that the judicial branch of, branch of government is considered to be the state for the purposes of international law identification. So I'm just going to turn it over to my colleague for the last couple of slides. You may remember the triangle. So if you take into account that it is a triangle that has relationships among their rights, it is important to know that not only the right to physical survival depends on the two rights that are at the bottom, but also the respect to the right to physical and cultural survival strengthens and fortifies the two rights that are at the bottom. So whenever you protect the right to physical and cultural survival, you will be enhancing property rights of indigenous peoples and participation rights of indigenous peoples. So we're going to start with examples of impacts of, on indigenous land rights. And I would like to start with just one example, which is the Sawaya Max Abi Parawahi case of the Inter-American Court, uh, where the Inter-American Court held that when there is a conflict, with a conflict between private property rights and indigenous property rights, uh, the latest must prevail because of the connection of these uh, indigenous territorial rights with their physical and cultural survival. And this is an important case because later on in Paraguay, which, which has been one of the most reluctant countries in South America in the recognition of indigenous rights, in 2014, the Supreme Court of Paraguay finally acknowledged that these property rights of indigenous people must prevail over private, uh, private property interests. So the owners of the private land brought a lawsuit against the expropriation statutory law that was trying to favor and protect indigenous land rights. And the Paraguayan Supreme Court, after decades of a long fight, finally recognized that this land was indigenous land. And, and said that it doesn't matter that the land in private hands is more productive, it belongs to indigenous peoples. And it also, the right to survival also has impact on particip participation rights. Uh, this is just one of the examples, Sarah Maccabi Surinam, that acknowledged that this uh, right to physical and cultural survival is connected not only with territorial lands, but also with resources of the territories. And if this is the case, consultation regarding the use of the, the resources that are located in the territories is a must, and not only is a must, in cases where there are major exploitation of these resources, there should be ethic, free, prior, and informed consent. Maybe we'll just, uh, alas, not continue to try to convince you of the significance of this uh, crucial right. But we'll just leave you with a couple of takeaways. The first is that a right of physical and cultural survival 
is recognized across Latin America and that meets the criteria for a particular right of customary international law. Second, not only does the evidence for existence meet the standard conventional criteria, but it also draws upon the legal traditions of a wide range of indigenous peoples across Latin America. And for us, this means that it also contributes to the suite of emerging rules of a unique form of indigenous law, not international human rights law, but a sui generis form that we believe in, in the work that we're doing, we're beginning to identify elements of. And that's a sui generis set of indigenous international legal rights.